Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research Innovation and Strategic Partnerships, the Registrar, the University Liberian, the Provost College of Medicine, Director Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies, who is literally is the inaugural lecturer, deans of other faculties of the postgraduate school and of students, directors of institutes and centers, heads of departments, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The 441st in the University of Ibadan inaugural lecture series will be delivered this evening by Professor Taju Dean Ademola Akanji of the Industrial and Peace Education Unit on behalf of his institute. Born on 1st December 1958 into the family of Pa Guari Akanji Abogunde, also known as Babaka Finta, and Alaja Fati Mat Bintu Adunola Akanji of Abogunde Compound, Ede, in, in, in the North Local Government Area of Oshun State. Professor Akanji attended the Local Administration Primary School, Agongwe Ede, and Okialuku Early Primary School in Loring Kwara State for his primary education, which he completed in 1917. He proceeded to Government Secondary School, Maran, in Kwara State from 1971, and completed his secondary education in 1975. He later attended the School of Education, now known as Kwara State College of Education, where he obtained the National Certificate in Education in 1979, majoring in Physics and Chemistry. He participated in the National Youth Service Corps Scheme from 1979 till 1980 in Oron, Akwa State. He taught at Muslim Grammar School of Dinjo Ibadan from 1980 to 1983. Later that year, he proceeded to the University of Benin for his Bachelor of Education degree in Chemistry, which he completed in 1986. He emerged as the best graduating student in his class, with second class honors upper division. He registered for his MSc Analytical Chemistry at the University of Ibadan in 1987, and graduated in December of the following year. He joined the services of the Federal Ministry of Defense where he worked as a technical training group, training command of the Nigerian Air Force, Kaduna, from 1991 to 1995. While in Kaduna, he served as a training records officer of the Nigerian Air Force and head of the general academics of the Aircraft Maintenance School. Thereafter, he returned to the University of Baden for his PhD program, first in environmental chemistry, but he later changed to industrial education in our Department of Adult Education where he obtained his PhD in January 1998. The then Dr. Akonji joined the services of the Department of Adult Education as lecturer grade two with the fell from 12th February 2001. He rode, rode through the ranks, being promoted lecturer one with the fell from 1st October 2004, senior lecturer with the fell from 1st October 2007, reader 1st October 2010, and professor 1st October 2013. He has published extensively and has to his credit over 70 journal articles, chapters in books, and conference proceedings. He has successfully supervised over 80 undergraduates, 100 master's degree projects, and he has also successfully supervised 10 doctoral theses. <laughs> Within this university, Professor Akonji who has a diverse background in chemistry, education before adult education, as well as uh, industrial and peace uh, education, has served in several capacities, such as coordinator MED program in our Department of Adult Education, director annual national conference of industrial relations, coordinator industrial education unit, assistant coordinator external degree program, senate representative board of the senior staff housing allocation committee, as well as the board of the International School, the University of Ibadan Sports Council, and senior staff disciplinary committee. He was also at the time acting chairman of the University of Ibadan Sports Council. He is currently the director of UI Water Enterprises. He served as president of the senior staff club, and is one of only two persons who have or had the opportunity to serve for two terms as a president of the staff club for the past 60 years.
the other person being the Professor Akusu of uh, Veterinary Medicine. As a unionist, Professor Akanji is an active member of ASU, both at the branch and national levels. And for many years, he was a national resource person to ASU. He was always quarreling with uh, Professor Ademola Remaso, who is uh, superior to the other at the national executive of ASU, since he was a national officer. He has been coordinator of the Humanitarian and Disaster Risk Management Unit at IPSS since its establishment, and is currently the director of the institute, which fell from 1st August 2018. Outside the university system, the inaugural lecturer has served as a resource person for the retraining of secondary school teachers in his native Ocean State from July 2007 to July 2008 and the inspection of secondary schools in New York State under the Millennium Development Goals. He has been external assessor for professorial candidates within and outside the University of Ibadan. A resource person to several industrial unions, such as Non-Academic Staff Union, NASU, the Association of Senior Staff of Banks, Insurance and Financial Institutions, National Union of Civil Engineering, Construction, Furniture and, Good Work and Woodworkers, National Union of Petroleum and Natural Gas, NUPENG, and the Nigerian Union of uh, teachers, NUT, is a member of the Nigerian delegation to the ECOWAS ministers and experts meeting on farmers others, others conflict at the ECOWAS parliament in Abuja, Nigeria, just to mention a few. is a consultant to several national, regional and international agencies and he has worked extensively in partnership with the National Assembly Committees on Security in the facilitation of joint capacity building and community dialogue programs for all arms of the security agencies and community members in the six geopolitical zones of our great country, Nigeria. He developed the curriculum and manual for training on the Niger Data Job Creation and Conflict Prevention Initiative, sponsored by the United Nations Office of Project Services. He has attended several professional programs, the latest being the Certificate in Conflict Prevention, Intervention, Reconciliation and Reconstruction from Transcend Peace University, Romania. A professional trainer and a chartered mediator, Professor Tajuddin Akanji is a member of several learned societies, including the Nigerian National Council for Adult Education, the Nigerian Society of Victimology, the National Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction in Nigeria, the Academy of Criminal Justice Science, member of the editorial board, International Police Executive Symposium, member of the Board of Trustees, Foundation for Victims of Child Abuse, member of West African Civil Society Forum, and is also a fellow of the Society for Peace Studies and Practice, among others. Professor Akanji is happily married to Omoba Amina Akanji, and the marriage is blessed with successful children and grandchildren. It's now my pleasure to call on Professor Tajuddin Ademola Akanji to deliver his inaugural lecture, the second from the Institute of Peace and Strategic Studies, titled, When Labor is the Beginning of Insecurity. Professor Akanji. The Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research, Innovation and Strategic Partnerships, the Registrar, University Librarian, Provost of the College of Medicine, Dean of the Postgraduate School, Dean of the Faculty of the Social Sciences, Deans of other faculties and of students, Director of the Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies, Directors of other institutes, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the beginning. The journey into the world of knowledge, we started in 1964 at Ellis Kwa in Oshu State, Nigeria, through Government Secondary School, Umara, Kwara State, also known as Makaranta, and finally to the University of Ibadan. It is today completed with the honor and the gift bestowed on me by Almighty Allah, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, to stand before this distinguished audience to give an inaugural lecture. I must confess that the journey has been consistently tedious, excruciatingly demanding, and interestingly strenuous. I therefore give all praises and glory to the giver of life, Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most beneficent and the most merciful. I came to the University of Ibadan in 1987 for my postgraduate program as a science student, not the science student of Olamide that I strong in the song. I came to the Department of Chemistry 
and I successfully completed my MSc in Analytical Chemistry on 16 December 1988, and subsequently registered for the PhD program in Environmental Chemistry the following year. I later abandoned this and went in search of life and living. But I came back in 1995 to the same department under the supervision of Professor Oladele of Shibanjo. However, because I was already employed at the, the, the technical training group of the Nigerian Air Force, I had to change my course to a discipline that is relevant to my employment. Therefore, I crossed the lawn from the Department of Chemistry to the Faculty of Education. And that was how God brought me in contact with Professor Murakio Adilaye Lanri Omali, also known as Comrade Omali, the Egrioke himself, who was my supervisor in the Department of Adult Education. After Professors Michael Omalewa and Deku Akitayo had facilitated my change of course from chemistry to adult education. It did not take too long before Professor Omali discovered the interest he had in me, having discussed labor issues with me. He saw the activists in me. And so when the Institute of African Studies was to start the Peace and Conflict Studies program, they had sought the cooperation of the Department of Adult Education in teaching of the industrial conflict aspect of the program. So he joyfully nominated me to join the Institute. So I can say that I was a foundation member of Peace and Conflict Studies program in this university. The, the experience which I garnered from teaching of the industrial conflict can never be forgotten. And that is, unfortunately, Professor Omale is not alive today. But I'm sure wherever he is, he will be happy that the baby he nurtured is delivering an inaugural lecture today. May God rest his soul. Amen. It is instructive to say that this is the second uh, inaugural lecture from the Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies, which was just created on 14 September, barely three years ago, uh, with uh, Professor Isaac Halbert, serving as the foundation director. The first inaugural lecture was delivered in 2017 by Professor Amos Oyosoji Aremu. Professor Albert had earlier delivered his own inaugural lecture in the Institute for African Studies before the creation of the Institute. The choice of this title, Mr. Vice Chancellor, distinguished members of the audience. I know many of you will be wondering and totally surprised with my title when labor is the beginning of insecurity. Considering the depth of insecurity we have in this country, some of you may even say I'm casting negative aspersion against neighbor. Let me say it publicly here that the interpretation was not intended. I am a friend of labor and I have spent all my life working as a scholar and as a practitioner in labor. And during these years, I have witnessed progressively how the, the, the creator of wealth I have been in, immersed in poverty. I've also witnessed the disappearance of the week of pride. That is the week when salaries are paid. And it has now become the week of grief because there is nothing to rejoice about. I've also witnessed that industrial actions, which used to be fun, are now becoming very serious battles. The situation calls for deep interrogation with a view to understanding the situation and contributing ideas necessary to bring positive changes to the society. The aim of this lecture is to analyze how labor can be a risk factor in state security. The choice of the title is born out of my obligation to speak truth to power, no matter the cost. However, the cardinal uh, issues associated with this title are founded in the course of this presentation. Let me say clearly that this lecture is premised on early warning, that is, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Insecurity, the dimensions of clarification. Although the word insecurity appears to be a popular concept of discussion, it is not as simple as a scientific concept probably due to its various dimensions. Adler, 1964-1971, analyzed security as a basic need. Human beings aspire to choose goals so that they can guarantee a niche prevent feeling of inferiority and support self-esteem. Back in 1986, in another careful and holistic analysis of security and its creation as well as its maintenance in the society, claimed that in its deepest meaning, the desire for security was an existential drive. He concluded that by wanting security, 
we are inadvertently cutting insecurity. In essence, the social product of insecurity means that people are vulnerable in their relationships. And in its extreme form, people may also see each other as threats and threats and enemies. Obasanjo, 1994. Onobo, 2005. And Dambazal, 2017. All linked the concept of security to citizens' welfare. Their views are in line with the 1994 UNDP Human Development Report, which noted that while there are two main aspects of human security, that is, freedom from fear and freedom from want, that the concept of security has always been linked to the former. It maintained the necessity to adopt an all-encompassing change in definition from an exclusive stress on territorial security to a much greater stress on people's security and from security through armaments to security through sustainable human development. Human security, therefore, covers the economic, food, health, environmental, personal, community, and political security. Some of the major indices of insecurity are denoted in inferiority complex, low or less self-esteem, sharp horizontal inequalities, inexistent or inadequate inclusive development, social, economic, political and income vulnerabilities and discrimination, often caused by poverty. The direct consequences of this insecurity is manifested in violence. Violence, as defined by WHO, is the intentional use of physical force or power, threatened or actual, against oneself, another person, or against a group or community that either results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. The insecurity that we emphasize in this lecture is human insecurity, which has the tendency to reinforce regimes through physical in insecurity. Whereas physical regime or physical regime security describes threats directed against the state, mainly in the form of military attacks, human insecurity draws attention to a wide scope of threats faced by individuals and communities. The solution to this involves approaches that are people-oriented locally driven, involving a wide range of stakeholders. It is not limited to the purchase of gunboats or helicopters, but involves more of protection and empowerment. In this lecture, man is seen as the center of insecurity. And since we know that violence is constructed in the heart of man, this lecture has discussed how labor is clearly a risk factor in insecurity. The structure of work and workplace at the root of labor insecurity. The structure of work and workplace can be described as the root of economic insecurity associated with in-work poverty. What is work? In this lecture, work is operationally defined as what we do and is seen by others as valuable, valuable and worthy of being paid for. So whether you are a doctor, an engineer, a dancer, or even a street worker, once you are giving service and it's being paid for, you are doing work. The structure of work and the workplace identifies labor as the most important factor in production, but labor is, is undermined as the creator of wealth measured by gross domestic product of a nation. As well known and do, do, documented in literature, the reward for capital, as economists will say, is interest. That for land is rent, for entrepreneur is profit, and for labor is salaries and wages. The first three of these rewards go to the employer, the only one that goes to the worker. That is the salaries and wages, the man that is creating the wealth. That is the one that is oftentimes manipulated or unpaid by employers. You see, it is very common to see salaries of workers being held for 10 months so that the employers can make money. The Yoruba palace will say, he said, that means that the injustice in the workplace arising from this negatively skewed distribution of the proceeds of the factor of production to labor have often accounted for the incessant strike actions and conflicts in the labor force. Therefore, because a hungry man is an angry man, it can be concluded from the beginning that labor is designed as a rig factor in insecurity. Judging from the unfair allocation from the proceeds of the factors of production, it is from this assertion that the title of this lecture when labor is the beginning of insecurity was coined. The asymmetric workplace relationship as a source of tension in the workplace. The workplace is where labor is utilized for production of goods and services. There are three main actors in the workplace. 
One, the workers, they supply labor for which they get salaries and wages and sometimes represented by the unions. The employers, they are the entrepreneurs, the profit makers. They supply the land and the capital. They get rent, they get interest and often represented by the management. Government, they are supposed, they are also employers, but they are supposed to be the, form, form, the, the policy formulators, the regulator of the interaction between the workers and the employers. In most developing countries, including Nigeria, government is the main employer of labor. That means the government is both an employer and a regulator. A situation where Nigeria and Ghana is playing the football match and the referee is from Ghana, you know what the results will be. The relationship in the workplace is explained by several theories. Notable among them are the unitary, the pluralist, and the system theories. The unity theory views the workplace as a unified theme with, a common, with common aims and objectives. The authority structure is one who takes decision on behalf of the entire team. Any opposition to this decision-making structure is regarded as irrational, as the relationship is paternalistic in nature. This theory opposes the existence of trade unions in the workplace because it is believed that it is paternalistic and that the father knows the need of his children notwithstanding what the children are asking for. The pluralist, on the other hand, views the organization as an amalgamation of several groups with divergent interests where the gain of one group is the loss of the other. The pluralist theory views the organization as a pie in which every actor is struggling through a process of survival of the fittest to get its own maximum share. Obviously, higher wages for workers is assumed to translate to reduce profit for the employer. Therefore, collective bargaining remains the legitimate form of settling dispute, and trade unions play important roles because it is the skill of bargaining that actually gets advantage for them. And that is why workers often believe united we bargain, divided we beg. The system theory. This is the theory postulated by J.T. Dunlop in 1958. It posits that an industrial relations system of any place at any time in its development comprises certain actors, certain contexts, and an ideology which binds together the system relations and creates a web of rules to govern the place. So it shows that the workplace, the work communities, they have to relate together. And this theory often explains the interactions in the workplace, which presupposes that there are bound to be various forms of tension in the workplace. The interaction of the actors in the workplace are bound to lead to conflicts, which determine the extent to which workers are able to carry out the work in the workplace. Workplace conflicts are a source of labor insecurity. Whenever people meet to conduct business, conflict becomes inevitable because interest may be multiple and may be incompatible. Workplace conflict can be classified into three main forms. Conflict of rights, those ones that are protected by the law, by collective agreements. Conflict of power, which relies greatly on subsisting influence, it relies on power. And one thing about power is that it does not rely permanently in a particular location. Conflict of interest, that is the one that takes interest of all actors into consideration. This conflict may exist latently or it can also manifest overtly. The overt forms are the ones that we see every day when workers go on strike. But the covert form is the commonest, but it is not manifested in the open. This is when workers come to the office and they don't work. They come to the office and they start to sell other things while in the office, and productivity is at the lowest self. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, that is the situation of most Nigerian workers today. I can say that Nigerian workers are perpetually on strike. They only come to work so that their lunch does not stop. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, what are the causes of workplace conflict? Workplace conflict can vary substantially in scope, intensity, number of participants, and objectives being sought. There are many reasons why conflicts occur in the workplace, but the most fundamental is based on the neglect of basic needs. And basic needs is what the workers must have. When this is neglected, then workers express interest, sometimes superfluous, that the employer cannot meet. And once they cannot meet this superfluous interest, then workers take position and conflict ensues. According to Maslow, the satisfaction of one level of need at a particular time does not preclude that there will be no conflict in future. The theory explains that the human needs are insatiable. So when workers go for negotiation, 
and they say ah, last year we gave you one why are you coming back they are only acting through to natural instincts another source of tension in the workplace is the issue of wage determination particularly comparable earnings created by wage differentials earning adequate wages for work done is a fundamental right of workers recognized by the 1948 united nations universal declaration of human rights which has the following content in article 23 one everyone has the right to work to free choice of employment to just and favorable conditions of work and to protection against unemployment two everyone without discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work three everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for himself and his family an assistance worthy of human dignity and supplemented, if necessary, by other means of social protection. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, failure to pay salaries of workers is a criminal offense, and perpetrators are criminals. In summary, we can say that the, generally the conflict between labor and management can be perfectly described as conflict between two unequal powers. The employers are usually supported by the law, oftentimes more powerful than the workers. And unless the imbalances in the workplace structure is addressed, conflict will remain inevitable in the society. In other words, there can never be peace when justice is compromised. Negatively skewed composition of the labor force as a dimension of labor insecurity. Labor in this lecture is referring to and has contained in the National Bureau of Statistics record. It comprises of persons between the ages of 15 and 64 years who are willing and are able to work regardless of whether they have a job or not. So when the population of workers are calculated, this is what is taken into consideration. Being employed, underemployed or unemployed are measured differently based on availability of the job and the number of hours for which a person is able to work, and the subsisting regulations, cultures, and social content. And certain categories of people are exempted from the labor force. They are full-time housewives. This is under normal circumstances, but full-time housewives, they still work. Under age children, those below the ages of 15, we know that we have child labor in this country. Adults over 60, 65, or 70, we know that people hide their ages so that even at 80, they are still in employment. Those in active military service and full-time students, we know many of our students are engaged in full-time work. The physically challenged or the incapacitated persons, in summary, it can be asserted that the labor force in Nigeria is categorized in terms of the number of hours. If a person works between 0 to 19 hours, is considered as unemployed. A person has worked between 20 and 39 hours is considered as underemployed. And 40 hours and above is considered as fully employed. But we know that some workers work for 72 hours in a week, and this is killing. The implication of this comp composition and fluctuation in Nigerian labor force to insecurity is discussed in the structure that is uh, being propounded, showing the number of underemployment and showing the number of unemployed uh, Nigerians. If you look at this structure, the age category between 15 and 24 and 25 and 34 categories, these are the youth age as uh, articulated in the not too young to run age. The high rates of underemployment and unemployment in this age category should be a cause for worry. It has been proved that poverty, which is the imminent result of unemployment among these age categories, can be a potent driver of insecurity in the society. This is an early warning to this country that another form of violence may erupt from this age category if their underemployment stroke unemployment status is not seriously addressed. Where basic needs of citizens are compromised by exposure to poverty caused by low pay, underemployment, unemployment, especially among the young ones, they tend to accept help from almost everyone willing to provide it. Oftentimes, these cells may come from insurgents, may come from Boko Haram, may come from criminals because they have no choice. So workplace classification as a dimension of labor insecurity. There are five measurable classifications that we find in our records. We have the work for pay. Those who work and collect salary, they represent 25.88% of the world population. The self-employed in the agricultural sector, 
represents 65.82 percent. The self-employed in the non-agricultural sector, the traders and others, they represent 28.95. Paid apprentice, 1.13. Unpaid household workers, they represent 7.17. If you look at the summary above, you will see that only 25 percent of the entire workforce are engaged in work for pay, those that collect salary. The chunk, that is 75 percent, are largely in the informal sector. My study on the informal sector has shown that the importance and the contribution of this sector to national economy and growth are often neglected, grossly uncalculated, and incorrectly calculated, Akaji 2008. This largely informs why some of the players in, in this sector have absconded and taken to Okada riding. The picture here shows the number of Okada riders we have in Nigeria today. In the present condition of economic depression, workers are surely the ones bearing the brunt of the failure of governance and mismanagement of public resources. In some of the, of the minimum wages that are being canvassed for by labor unions, what you should be asking for is how much will it make a worker to live graciously or minimally in Nigeria? The table that we have on the screen now is the one that shows the figure of the average cost of living measured by consumer price index for all items and food only against the prevailing inflation rate in the economy and the growth rate of worker salary measured through prevailing minimum wage. The bar chart shows that for the period covered, cost of living and inflation rate have witnessed tremendous increase at the expense of worker salary which has remained constant since 2012 and has refused to grow. Also, the statistics of inflation in Nigeria posted by ECA International reveal that while inflation keeps going up over the years, the real wages of workers keep reducing as a result of the depreciating value of the Naira. The economic implication of this analysis is that the present minimum wage of 18,000 and even the 56,000 Naira being negotiated for by the Nigerian Labor Congress will be grossly inadequate to meet up with the trending cost of living in Nigeria. The vicious circle of poverty remains and is being transferred from one generation to the other without the opportunity that education and attainment provides as a leverage for the children of the poor. How can we build an egalitarian society in the present situation? Certain categories of labor, having been treated with this level of injustice, can become potential recruits for crime and corrupt practices. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, the analysis of the least paid worker as drawn above calls for a routine in the income structure of the workplace in Nigeria considering the fact that some other workers in the same country who probably do not put in equal number of hours as other workers are paid extremely outrageous running costs. According to the revelation made by Senator She Usani, a serving senator in Nigeria, he said each senator receives a running cost of 13.5 million naira in a month. This connotes that in four years or 48 months, assuming that there is no other income from overside receipts, seating allowances as committee memberships, extra code from overseas stores, salaries, and so many other egregious that they mean. A senator will earn in 48 months, in four years, 648 million as running cost. In contrast, the maximum salary of a professor at bar is 502,000 monthly. Assuming that he or she pays no tax, no pension contribution, no rent deduction, and others, and assuming that from the day he was employed, he was employed as a professor at bar, it means that when he worked for 35 years or 420 months, the maximum salary we earn is 211 million, which accounts for only 32.66 percent of the running cost of a senator for working in just four years. This is how injustice manifests and subsequently leads to inferiority complaints, agitations, strike actions, and other indices of insecurity. Besides these factors, employment casualization has become the order of the day in Nigeria. Furthermore, many organizations still prevent workers from unionizing, forgetting that it is the trade union that can actually bring peace to the society. Further insights into insufficient monthly income for expenditure purposes as a source of labor. Mr. Vice Chancellor, in my attempt to measure inward poverty in Nigeria, 
I carried out a survey along with my research students in the institute. And what we discovered were quite instructive. The survey was carried out at, in random locations and neighborhoods in the city of Ibadan. The finding from the survey, as presented below, reveals that the expenditure per group overshoots the income received. So we wonder where people are getting money to feed. These categories of workers have been exposed to serious poverty with likely consequences for insecurities. The imperatives of labor insecurity is that of all factors prevented, presented above, that being responsible for tension in the workplace, the incidence of workplace poverty has been reported as the most striking of Basar 2015. Poverty in its simplest form is the lack of basic means of subsistence. In effect, a poor person is unable to satisfy his needs. There are different forms of poverty based generally on limitations in the exercise of choice by an individual due to certain factors. A working poor man has choices and decisions to make on daily basis, but his choices are often limited by the level of resources available to him. He knows that stockfish is very good for him, but he will go for Okweko because of the limitation of his pocket. And economic hardship are one of the most potent drivers in new work poverty and economic hardship is the incidence of low wage employment. A low wage employment occurs mainly among unskilled workers. These, there are some conditions that actually predisposes some workers to low pay jobs. Key among these conditions is the issue of low or poor quality education. Poor quality education often leads to low level of vocational skills. We can't get quality jobs. When we watch loud tech being locked for almost one year, where are we going to get it from? Also, with the prediction by the social scientists that the labor to working age population in Nigeria is expected to expand from 97 million in 2015 to 115 million, 51 million in 2030, or and Lawansi. And these are mainly young workers. And with the possibility that these working age population are likely to be low skilled and poverty prone, the threat of the coming insecurity is huge and real. Unless we address the issues surrounding the funding of our educational system, which is directly connected to the quality of labor, the coming events are the beginning of insecurity. The effect has regional implications because the coming working age population will represent 16% of Africa's labor force in work poverty in the ivory tower. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I collected the records of gross pay and net pay of academic and non-academic staff of the University of Baden from 2015 to 2017 and just oppose this with the consumer price index extracted from the MBS report, I can then validly say that there is in-work poverty in the university. The rate and intensity of workers' agitation in the university has become very high in the last four years. It may not be out of place to say that poverty is the driving force for this new level of violence with its security implications. The introduction of poverty into the ivory tower is not a mere accident. It might have actually been a deliberate attempt by the authorities or the political class to bring down our dehumanized intellectuals. Notwithstanding the fact that we are expected to be the fulcrum of national development, not minding the fact that the minds of the young learners, constituting more than half of the population, are entrusted in our hands, government at all levels prefer to pay ridiculous low wages so that the society will have no respect for the academia. They even hold on to salaries of a university lecturer for 10 months. It is criminal. At independence, the academia in Nigeria constituted the petite bourgeoisie and the emergent elders, but in less than a decade afterwards, the economic and social contradiction deteriorated to the levels of the toiling people that they have obligations to defend, as through 2017. In Europe and America, the situations are different. Scholars are treated differently because they are expected to be the main pillars of national development. We are generally and constantly inspired by Ralph Chaplin's song written in 1915. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity. Solidarity. 
Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. E Africa, my contribution to the university community and the world of knowledge. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I had told this August audience that I came to this university for my postgraduate program to study analytical chemistry in 1987. The knowledge that I garnered from the Department of Chemistry from my teachers were not wasted after all. For instance, to the, great, to the glory of God, I have the mandate of the university management to plan, establish, and maintain the University of Bada Water Enterprises, which produces portable water that the university community drinks. These are done with several names within the university and beyond, such as Haji Water, Akanji Olomi, Baba Water, among others. In terms of mentoring, I have successfully supervised 10 doctoral theses and over 100 master degree projects in various aspects of adult education, including industrial education, community education, peace education, and social welfare. Many of my doctoral students are also reproducing themselves in several universities in Nigeria. Some of the works which we did together cultivated most of the ideas of today's lecture in my mind. I also had the opportunity of working with other scholars in adult literacy to produce the working document for the art of school children in Nigeria. The data obtained from these were developed into security implications and were jointly presented with Lieutenant General Abraham and Belo Dambazao at the UN Interagency Framework Team for Preventive Action, New York City in 2012. We concluded, based on the 2010 Nigerian Education Data Survey, that about 31% of Nigerian children were out of school, and 75% of the population were among the Fulanese and the Kanuris located in the Northwest and the Northeast geopolitical zones in Nigeria. This lends credence to the fact that educational deprivation has multiple impacts on the lives of Nigerians and may be precariously responsible for the reported trend and pattern of the upsurge in youth criminalities and the sectarian violence in Nigeria today. This we predicted in 2012, and it was confirmed in 2017 through 2018. After I had the opportunity to serve on the Presidential Committee on Disposal of Special Detainees linked with Boko Haram insurgencies, while on this assignment, I interacted with close to 7,000 detainees located in several detention facilities within and outside Nigeria. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, it is a pity that I do not have the privilege of sharing the details of this report on this occasion, but because it is a restricted security document. However, I can, within the limit of scholarship, confirm to you that many unserved and underserved working age population are engaged in the insurgent activities which we experience today in Nigeria. In my bid to ascertain many of the factors responsible for tension in the workplace, I embark on various stories along with my research students, including the examination of the role of emotional intelligence on organization conflict resolution in Nigeria, Akaji and Bankole 2007, the examination of the concept of emotional intelligence and its potential to engender good interpersonal working relationship as well as industrial peace in the organization, Akaji and Bankole 2007B, the examination of the incidence of working environment on labor relations and achieving organization goal in industry, Akaji and Yoyusu 2009, among others. An empirical study was also carried out to determine the interaction between the quality of work life and the tension observed in the workplace, Bankoli and Akaji 2012. This study established that quality of work life is a strong predictor of employees' job commitment. Also, in a bid to understand the way in which employers and workers generally interact in the workplace, an investigation into the dynamics of social dialogue and consensus building in Nigeria, industrial relations was carried out, Akaji and Samuel 2012. We discovered from empirical studies that the workplace is increasingly becoming conflict reading as the major actors have in recent times found it difficult to work together in cooperative ways. Upon the creation of the institute in 2015, there was an integration of the humanitarian and refugee studies program of the Reform Center for Peace and Community Studies, CEPAS, and the Disaster Risk Management Program formerly located in the Department of Geography. I was appointed the coordinator of that unit. We had the responsibility of working with NEMA. The first major assignment I had with NEMA was to represent the agency on the experts meeting on development of the interface between modern and traditional early warning systems for disaster reduction in Nigeria. I have cons consequently instituted many DRR projects which are currently ongoing in the Institute. Conclusions and recommendations. Mr. Vice Chancellor, distinguished audience, in this lecture, 
have been able to show how labor can be a risk factor in the level of insecurity in the society. For emphasis sake, these sources include the structure of work and workplace, the asymmetric workplace relationship, workplace conflict, composition and fluctuation of the labor force in terms of age grouping and poor educational system, the neglect of the informal sector, non-compliance with decent work agenda, minimum average cost of living service worker salary, workplace poverty, low wage employment, casualization, non-unionization, and the impending demographic transformation, that is the youth board. Some of these sources create tension in industrial disputes in the workplace and thus provide the avenue for workers to agitate, engage in strike through picketing actions, engage in violent demonstrations, lockouts, engage in physical attacks of other personnel, engage in psychological arms to others, among others. As my modern contribution to this, I'm therefore putting forward the following recommendations. Creation of better quality jobs. In spite of the government's popular slogan that Nigeria is among the largest economies in Africa, incidences of poverty and risk of insecurity are still on the rise. Before the effect of the economic policies of government can be adequately felt, there's the need to create better quality jobs in order to address unemployment, underemployment, and poverty. The manufacturing sector, which has almost gone moribund as a result of infrastructural deficit, should be galvanized to expand the number of people in productive employment, instituting reasonable conditions of service, wages, and salaries. The most important solution to the elimination of in-work poverty in the labor force remains wage increase or upward review of salary commensurable to meaningful living standard. In this regard, the ongoing slow-paced discussion between the federal government representatives and the amalgamated labor union should be accelerated and concluded on time and should be done in good faith devoid of political coloration. <laughs> Such resolution should be backed by an act of parliament which will make it compulsory for implementation by all employers of labor in the country because we have the Cassitrant governor who, after this agreement is signed, will fail to implement in their places of work. Social safety net. The issue of in-war poverty and inequality prevalent among the labor underscore the urgency for development of social safety net for the labor force in Nigeria. SSN programs should be designed to protect the poor and vulnerable workers from shocks and contribute to reducing poverty. Higher investments in worker education and lifelong learning. The present state of funding, especially of higher education in Nigeria, is calamitous. Unless we turn things around, the benefit that we can get from the predicted expansion of the working population through youth board will end up increasing the risk of insecurity in this country. We need to declare a state of emergency in the education sector and fund it aggressively. Infrastructural development. Develop infrastructures will improve the ease of doing business and hence ensure creation of decent jobs through foreign and local investments. Infrastructures like power, transport, water and sanitation, telecommunications and irrigation are very critical to the economic transformation. Nigeria budget should start paying greater attention to infrastructure as the federal government is said to be doing at present. Diversification of the economy to address the issue of underemployment or unemployment. The dependence on oil as the only source of revenue over a long period has affected the growth of the nation and its ability to address the problem of underemployment. The education of the economy, especially into agriculture, has the potential to address the issue of underemployment and unemployment. Improvement of the informal sector. The informal sector is the biggest contributor to employment in Nigeria. The neglect of this sector has adversely affected the growth of economic activities and has caused more security threats than other sectors. Foreign investors should be made to include capacity development in the memoranda of understanding, strengthening of institutions and governance. The fact that there is serious governance deficit in Nigeria cannot be controverted. Corruption has eroded the capacity of institutions to be adequately beneficial to the economy. The cost of maintaining the governance institution at present is higher than what is needed to maintain the entire workforce in Nigeria. What we spend on 109 senators and 360 members of House of Representatives is more than what the other workforce earns. And governors only go at the end of the month to Abuja to go and if that is the only thing that governance entails, it 
means anybody can be a governor. So we have to address the issue of governance deficit in this country. Development of the manufacturing sector. It is a sad commentary that most of our manufacturing industries have closed down and have been bought over by religious houses and clubs. This can be seen in several places in Lagos, Ibadan, and other cities in the country. In order to create employment that will absorb the expanding working population, aggressive attention should be paid to development and technological upgrade, upgrade of the manufacturing sector in general, and the labor-intensive ones, such as the textile industry and the steel industry, should be addressed. Acknowledgement. Glory and adoration to my Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Praises and blessings to his prophet and friend. The seal of prophethood, Muhammad son of Abdullah, the Imam of the true worshippers of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I am a product of grace. Therefore, the space and time here cannot be sufficient for me to mention all persons living and departed who have contributed in some ways, or in many ways, to my making and remaking, and ensuring that today is a reality. He created man from clay, like pottery. So, which of the favors of my Lord will I deny? Quran 55 verse 14. Of particular mention are my parents, Pa Buari Akanjia Bogunde. Unfortunately, I don't have the picture of my father because he was a very indigent person. No photographer in that time. And none of us could afford to take his photograph. But my father, Buari Akadja Bungude, also known as Baba Kafinta, I also remember my mother, also known as Yaileri, both of whom are of blessed memory today. My father had many wives, but was survived by only two. Therefore, I'm equally grateful to my stepmother, Awawu Buari Abogunde Iyeleko, also of blessed memory. May Allah grant all of them as Jannah Fridaus. Amen. Although my father died several years ago, I still constantly meet people who proudly tells me, Oma Borepo, your father was a good man. It was not a coincidence, therefore, that he was named Buhari from the Arabic word, Abi Khair, which means good father, Babariri. Growing up, my mom made a promise to me that she would sponsor my education to Mititi, the highest possible level, as a result for always coming home with good results in my examination. Unfortunately, she's not here today because she transited to eternity a few years ago. However, I thank God that she was at my doctoral convocation ceremony, although the crisis on that day did not allow us to enter the hall. I am very grateful to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Abel Idowu Olayinka, <laughs> for providing me the opportunity to receive the honor of a lifetime today. I said earlier on today to him that I don't think we will ever fight again. I acknowledge the Deputy Vice Chancellors and my brother and friend is not here the alert man. I also thank the immediate past director of the Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies, Professor Isaac Olawale Albert, for nominating me to present this lecture. I recognize my colleagues in the Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies, Professors Oyesoji Aremu, Dr. Ruth Adia Moses, Dominic Danjibu, Solai Shola, Adeniro Aluko, Willie Asalebo, there are very many. I may not be able to mention uh, all of them here. I appreciate the Secretary of the Institute, Mrs. Chin Yedalawari, and other non-academic members of staff. The Royal Fathers here are present. I acknowledge with pride the Timiagbale Laminisa, Oba Munirudin Lawad, the Timi of Eden. KBSU, for the opportunity of coming to witness this and recognizing me as a proud son of Ede. I am very grateful to you, Kadis. I was, I hope 
Before we leave this place, the only one of whom my very good friend will still be inside this hall. Because he has promised me to be here. And let me also recognize the Etsu of Unyaba, Bagadoshi, His Royal Highness, Major General Retired, Abdullahi Bagudu Maman, former Minister of Internal Affairs of this country. He has come from his palace to come and witness this. I'm very grateful to you. I recognize my own brother, my immediate elder brother, the Olu of Olon Ushogo, Oba Karim Bwari Akaji, His Royal Highness. I also recognize Oba Adeoye Benga Adigun Lola, the area of Ofiki land, who I expect that he will soon be joining us very soon. I recognize all of you. Thank you for coming. I'm today recognizing the pride, with pride, the man who took me on that cold January morning to enroll me at early primary school, Ede. His name is Alaji Lamidia de Sabolanle. Unfortunately, he could not be here today. He was a motivating figure in the extended family for all of us to enroll. I'm grateful to my siblings. I've mentioned the KBC of Karimu. Oladi Yakoji, the Olu of Olorun Shogo. I've also, my sister is here, my younger sister, who at one time or the other was working to ensure that we were going to school. Muina Afibiki Adesola, for the financial assistance at various levels of my schooling. I recognize my other sibling, Musiba and Kasim, for their support and solidarity. I am very grateful to my supervisor in the Department of Chemistry, Professors Oladi Loshibanjo and O.O. Faboya, and all the members of the chemistry department, I still remain a member of the chemistry family. When I crossed the sports arena to the Faculty of Education, the first person I met was Professor Depu Akitayo, who was then the sub dean postgraduate of the faculty. He warmly received me and made, me change my, made the change of my course possible. I'm very grateful to him, not because he allowed me to change my course, but he also allocated me to a supervisor, who later turned out to be the most important mortal being in my life today. That was late Professor Morakio Ajileye Lanri Omale. Diegiroke. Diegiroke is not here, but his son is seated in this hall. That is the chairman of ASU of this branch. This was the man who put my feet on the path of academic exploit and blessed my aspiration. But for Igiroke, even if I would still have presented an inaugural lecture today, I would have been describing bond angles and reaction pathways before the audience. I also extend my own equivocal gratitude to my colleagues from the Faculty of Education, especially in the Department of Adult Education, where I got the chair that is being inaugurated today. I'm particularly grateful to Professors K.O. Ojoketa, Kainde Kesta, Kaya Biona, Deborah Egun Yomi, and others like Dr. Sarumi, Adelore, Medina Mama, all of them too numerous for me to mention here. But let me single out the man who held my hand to the office of Professor Omale for me to go and accept the offer of appointment which I had either to rejected. That was Professor Abrashid Adewumi Adeniwye. I am very grateful to him. Other members of staff are well appreciated. I appreciate the support of the Education Summit in the staff club. They know themselves. And I recognize all the members of staff of UI Water Enterprises, including the distributors and the suppliers. My second home, the senior staff club, where I was president for four good years. I cannot sweep away the inspiration that I derive and see deriving from the staff club. Some unbelievers think that the only thing they do in the staff club is to drink and gossip. Many professors and their chair in the staff club today. I cannot be mentioned Baba Lucas, Baba Fadikwe, Baba Desalu, Baba Jaku, Engina Kitewe, Baba Gubi, so many of them they are worthy of my appreciation. The friends of the staff club, 
bayo kwa de ale sugumba ido ufara yi biodu sani ukola aileru so many of them i cannot mention here i appreciate especially professors francis ebukari ayoke indi and kester ojoketa for the editorial work on this lecture my fleeting gratitude goes to the members of my immediate constituency asu the chairman past chairman executive committee and all the members Many uh, ASU members have come from various branches from within and around here and even from far and beyond. I'm very grateful. I remain an activist forever and I'm committed to the life of uh, ASU. Yes, we will sing that one. I recognize, I also recognize all the generals that came from Abuja, I know that the Nigerian Defense, uh, the, the National Defense College is being represented here by General Dauke, and so many other generals are present here. I'm so grateful for you honoring my invitation. <laughs> Members of the GSS Omana Old Boys Association, that is my immediate family. They are here, many of them in their numbers. The head boy of my set, those from 1971 to 1975, they are all seated in this hall. Thank you for coming. I'm so happy. Members of NASU, SANU, and other unions in the university, I'm very grateful for you. Then the victim for the Child Abuse Foundation, where I am the acting chairman of Board of Trustees. We have the president here, General Abdul Malik, uh, General Jubril uh, Abdul Malik, and the national secretary, Dr. Uche N. Uche. The members of the Presidential Committee for the Disposal of Special Detainees, particularly the chairman, His Royal Highness, General Baguru Maman. And I will recognize especially the vice chairman, who is my adopted sister. She is a fellow of the Society for Peace Studies and Practice and a member of the board, Ambassador Fatima Balla. She is the chairman of NYSC board. She is seated in this hall. And the registrar and the CEO of Teacher Regulatory Council of Nigeria, Professor Josiah Olushe Gwajiboye, and all the members of TRCN, they are wonderful people. I also wish to recognize especially my good friend, Honorable Minister of Interior, Lieutenant General Brahman Belo Dambazao, who could not come here today, but asked General Jibril Abdul Malik to come and represent him. I'm so grateful to the General. Members of my family from Abugunde and Oloba families from Ede, many of them are here. I'm grateful to them. My in-laws, the royal family of Dadu Folani, they are represented in this university by Otello, in case you do not know. I'm so grateful to them for, for, for giving me their child. I wish to thank members of my immediate family. My children, many of them are not here. Unfortunately, that is what happens to us when we send our children to the Oibo land. They could not be here now. Rukayat Adebinkwe, Sultan Ahmed, Afis Okoyemi, Ghaniya Tatinuke, Muhammad Awal is not seated there, he's the one that is manipulating what we are seeing here. He is my technical advisor. And so, my grandchildren are blessings to the family. I'm so happy to have them. Now, finally, let me appreciate the woman behind the scene, the rugged warrior, the astute defender. They refer to her as army soldier. My wife of over three decades, army nun. You have been a great friend and companion and pillar. I'm almost amazed by the level of your courage and energy. May God grant you long life in happiness and sound health. All the people whose names I have inadvertently omitted here should forgive me particularly members of my family from Ilori. We, I mean, when you get to Ilori, you ask of Ilia there, that is our house. And that's where everybody knows that we all grew up. I'm so happy that some of them are even here. So all the people I did not mention should forgive me. Let me end this lecture with this quotation, which I adapted from the speech of J.F. Kennedy, the former president of America. If the pursuit of learning is not defended by the educated citizen, it will not be defended at all. For there will always be those who scoff at intellectuals, who cry out against research, who seek to perish our educational system. They see no harm in paying lower wages to those in whose hands they entrust the minds of their children and they, and they pay to the corrupt politicians and their drivers. 
But the educated citizen knows that knowledge which he has is power, more so today than ever before. He knows that only an educated and informed people will be a free people, for a people united can never be defeated. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for your patience and kind attention. God bless you all. Thank <laughs> you.